AK family, it's Danny and Landon, and we're here outside of Las Vegas, Lake Mead, at the Hoover Dam. We're about to go on the Hoover Dam Dam Tour. So, we're going to show you guys what all this Dam Tour is about. So, stick around. All right, so good afternoon. For those of you that did not ride a mine elevator down here, my name is Eno, and I'm going to be your guide for this stop and the next two stops. So before I start, I'm going to give you a quick orientation on this map that we're looking at. We start upstairs, 537 feet at the visitor center. We rode that elevator a minute and 10 seconds down here. We landed right in this location. And we made a right turn to follow that yellow line. That yellow line represents that tunnel behind us, and we walk right inside this diversion tunnel. So approximately 537 feet below the surface, there are four parallel diversion tunnels. There are two on the Nevada Canyon wall side of the river, and across the river, there are two on the Arizona Canyon wall side of the river. So we are in the inner Nevada diversion tunnel. So these tunnels are five stories tall. It's hard to believe that, but this building is actually sitting on top of a 30-foot diameter headstock pipe. That pipe beneath, beneath you is three stories tall. It's bringing water from the lake from your right, and moving from your right to your left, towards the park then. So that gives you the 20 foot clearance to the top, that's the 50 feet diameter, and we're centered in the, in the middle of this one mile tunnel. So back in the 1930s, when they decided to build the Hoover Dam right here between the Black Canyon Walls on the Colorado River, before they can start construction in this dam, they had to get rid of something temporarily. And that was the Colorado River. Because you cannot build a dam in the middle of a raging river. So the plan was to go upstream about a half a mile from where the dam stands today, pick spots against the Black Canyon Walls, in Nevada, Arizona, roughly 12 feet higher than the river's edge, and by using about 5 million pounds of dynamite instead of blasting these big diversion dumps. Two went into the Nevada Canyon Wall side of the river, two went into the Arizona Canyon Wall side of the river. They went in the rocks, stayed in the rocks for about 4,000 feet, and out downstream. And the idea was to divert that water into these diversion tunnels to move that water around the construction site so we can get it dry so we can fill it in. But how do you do that when the natural flow of the water continues between the canyon walls? Well, the answer were coffer dams. And you saw those in the movie upstairs, but they actually had two coffer dams on site. They had a 100 feet tall upper coffer dam, constructed just behind the entrance of the diversion tunnels, then they had a 60 feet tall lower coffer dam downstream. Now, coffer dams consist of rock, dirt, concrete, and when it was piled high enough and thick enough, expand the entire river of the Colorado River. Then as the river is flowing from north to south, it would bounce off of it and be naturally redirected to the nearest open diversion tunnel to move that water around the construction site. That lower coffer dam, its only job really was to prevent any backwash or backflow of the Colorado River from reaching the side of the boat. So they, they went back to where the Hoover Dam stands today, and they excavated another 135 feet down and hit bedrock. Once they hit bedrock, they can start laying the foundations for the dam. And like you saw in the movie upstairs, a 16-ton bucket of concrete, or eight cubic yard bucket of concrete, was then delivered every 78 seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop for two straight years, day and night, till they built the dam. Once the dam was built, they went back upstream and they closed off the four diversion tunnels. So they dropped these gates, you know, 50 by 50, 3 million pounds steel bolted gates. When they dropped, they sealed each one of them shut. Now the Colorado River flowing from north to south is bouncing off the copper dam, but can no longer go into the diversion tunnels. So it had no choice, but to eventually come up and over that copper dam and started filling Lake Mead. And that took about six and a half years to fill, 1935 to 1941. And today, Lake Mead still remains the largest man-made reservoir in the United States. Now, at the same time Lake Mead was filling up, the workers came from the back sides of these diversion tunnels in trains pulling concrete mixes. And they proceeded about halfway to all the tunnels, and they installed what we now call these diversion tunnel plugs. A diversion tunnel plug is a 405 feet thick concrete plug. Once installed, water will never ever pass through them again. So from 1935 and forever, the first half of these diversion tunnels are completely sealed and underneath about 500 feet of water in Southern Lake today. However, the latter halves of these diversion tunnels, just past the plugs, that were not affected by these plugs, are still in use today. The two on the outside are linked with these massive spillways, whether it's Nevada or Arizona. 
These spillways you'll see when you're on top of the dam today with the outdoors of eight. These spillways are our safety mechanisms in case of flooding. If there's ever a time there's too much water in the lake, such as happened in 1941 and 83, water will then overflow from the lake into the spillways down a 600 foot tube to reconnect with that existing diversion highway down below that was not affected by the flood, and that water will shoot past the dam for the safety of the park. The two inner diversion tunnels are linked with these intake towers. Those intake towers are those four big concrete structures that you'll see when you're on top of the dam today, looking towards the lake. Each of those intake towers are 395 feet tall. Connected to them are these 30 foot diameter penstock pipes that are actively moving water right down from the lake, down to the power plant, to spit the turbines and make electricity. If you forgot what I said this uh, uh, when you first came in, that pipe underneath us is that big penstock pipe. It's moving water right down from the intake towers of the lake, coming underneath us, going towards the power plant. That rumbling you hear is upwards of 96,000 gallons a second moving underneath us, going towards the power plant. Uh, folks, I'm not going to talk about the power plant because that's our next stop. Building down at the base of the dam. We are currently on the right side of that power plant in the battle wing. To our immediate left is the Colorado River, and to the left of that is the Arizona River. So there are 17 commercial generators down here. There are nine in Arizona, and there are eight here in the back. But if you're already counting the generators and the generator lights right now, you're only going to see seven. And that's right, because for generator number three, the battle three, has been dismantled for repair and maintenance. So if you look over the rails in front of you, down on the floor, down below, you're going to see the inner workings of generator number three. You're going to see the rotor, you're going to see the plates, you're going to see the laminates, you're going to see the, the, uh, the shaft, and some other things that they've been working on for the past several weeks. But the rest of the generators that are standing in front of you are all 70 feet tall. But you can only see the top 30 feet of them. From that exciter cap, from that light on top to the floor is 30 feet. The rest of the generator is below the floor, about 40 feet. If there is a light on on top of the generator, that indicates that generator is currently online and is producing power right now. And just by looking straight down the road, the first one online is the battery one and one. Then you got the battery two, the battery five, seven, and eight are all online as well. When they're online, they produce 130 megawatts of power each. When combined, all 17 generators will produce upwards of 2,080 megawatts of power. That's instantly enough electricity for about 2 million homes. 56% of the electricity that we generate here on an annual basis goes to Southern California. That's our biggest customer. And then the rest is almost equally divided between Southern Nevada and Arizona. Now the next generator we want to point out is a little bit smaller generator. If you look down below the floor, you're going to see the rotor that I pointed out to you earlier. But between this rotor down below and the number one generator, you're going to see that Superman whaling on the floor. Inside that Superman whaling is that rust colored piece of equipment. That is actually a melted water wheel generator. It produces 2.4 megawatts of what we call in-house power. So that's the generator that produces all the electricity for the Hoover Dam, the power plant, the gift shop, the Ross Visitor Center. It runs our elevators. Everything you were there, that is our internal generator. And we have two of them. We have this one here, we have its twin sister on the Arizona side. Because as you can imagine, they have to be running 24 7. So by having two, we can run one and the rest just maintain the other. But this particular one that brought me down below, the very first generator ever to be put in operation with all of you were there, and that was back in September 11, 1946. Now the next thing I want to point out is actually a little bit bigger, and it's going to be higher than our field division. If you look towards the ceiling somewhat, you're going to see the first of two original P&H bridge plates of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I say one of two because the first one here has an American flag, as you can see, but its brother is hanging over the last generator down there. Now these bridge plates span the width of the room, and they all drive our tracks about the entire length of this car. Each of these bridge trains up here can lift 300 tons. To give you an idea how much lifting capability that is, think of the Statue of Liberty in New York City Harbor. She weighs 225 tons, so that means just one of these bridge trains alone can easily lift her off the ground. But why do we have two of them down here? Well, the answer lies again when that rotor directly over the rails down along the floor. Those rotors down below and all these other rotors inside these generators can weigh upwards of five. So that means we have to link both these bridge cranes together to form what we call the super crane. So 
They could lift that motor down below with any other motor in and out of these generator assemblies or air fans. Now the last thing I want to present to you is actually behind everybody are the balconies. If you follow my arm up this big wall right here, you are staring at the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam stands 726 feet tall. The crest length at the top is 1244 feet long. Just shy of a quarter mile spanning the ladder with Arizona. The top of the dam is 45 feet thick, and that's the road. But just as impressive is the thickness of the base of the dam below us. The base of Hoover Dam is 660 feet thick. To give you an idea how much concrete that is, take a look at this wall right here, and then turn your heads completely around and look at that far wall of passive generators down there. That would be a distance of 650 feet. So you'd still have to add another 10 more feet to the length of this room, fill this room with concrete from top to bottom, and that would equal the thickness of the base of Hoover Dam walls. Ladies and gentlemen, Hoover Dam is 6.6 .6 million tons of solid concrete. Three, 
Boulder City. Some of you may have driven through that town to get here. It's only about 11 miles away as opposed to 20 plus miles up river to Boulder Canyon. And it was easy to get the, all the equipment, the big rivets, the supplies, the, they made their own railroad. So it was easy to do that. And then most importantly, at peak time, 5,000 men built the river dance. So it was easy to transport the game. So those are some of the features of why the river dance is this location. All right, you guys, you guys are going to follow me. I'm going to stay on the right. We're getting ready to go on the game. So here we are inside the Hoover Dam. So that's pretty cool. This is letting you know that it's in 10 feet increments. What block you're in. Remember, we were at the 705. When we came up, I said we're 975. So if there was a problem or concern, like on June 15th, 1942, they saw this crack. They start doing the math, they were measuring, they were dating, and they would come back later to do the measurements again. So they were able to report back the exact location of any problems or concerns inside this wall. Answer your question. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now, so as we walk along, you're going to see what I call, I made this up, hieroglyphics. Um, yeah. yeah. And then you also want to see some other things like first names, last names, and dates. And I call that damn idiots. So please don't be a damn idiot. That's people disrespecting the Hoover Dam. So we're about to go see another photo opportunity. From the power plant core to the top of the dam, there's 717 steps that will take us up and out of here. Y'all ready? Yeah. It'll take us about 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. Uh -huh. We got the elevator. No, the elevators didn't work for the men. They couldn't take the elevators while they were still doing it. So they had to take these steps for about to see. We're not seeing those, y'all. We're going to see them. We're not taking them. They're just for photo ops. Damn. But the men, when they were building the dam, this is what they had to do during their work day. They couldn't take elevators or anything like that. So imagine them. They had their tools. They had their pads. They were going up and down, up and down every day. So we're going to take those pictures. But before we get there, Hoover Dam is built to withstand an 8.5, 8.6 earthquake. It has withstood a 5.2 earthquake in the 1950s. So we know this because at the end of this tunnel, on the floor, there's a seismic clock keeping track of the movement here at Strike the Remember, Nevada, California, Arizona, and the fault line. Before we get to this YouTube, there's an alarm that's going to sound. And then on the wall, there's a phone that's going to ring. And I have to answer the phone. You know who's going to be on the other end of the line? Biden. No. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, so that ends our tour of the Hoover Dam. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe, share us out. Comment below if you've ever been to the Hoover Dam. And uh, thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, take time to make memories. Great, guys. Thank you.